What's his moral example to Muslims, to the Ummah? Yes. Okay. So, do you accept that Muhammad, according to tradition, he had sex with Aisha when she was nine years old? No, no, no. Uh, so, from what I've been told, I'm just saying, you know. So, from my research into this, because like, this has been something that has always quite sort of astounded me, to be honest with you, because I, I can't accept that even a, 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 an average person could do such a thing and be considered an average person, really. But to be told that they are the greatest moral example, to me that seems like bizarre. Like, I, like, I can never really accept that. Um, I mean, I could like. Okay. Does that so, make sense? Yeah. So the way that I would. Hey, good to see you, my friend. So what I think is, obviously, our Muslims look at Aisha as being uh, you know, an exceptional woman. Um, and we, at that age. Okay. So we believe, we generally believe that she would have started menstruating much earlier, much earlier than most girls. So she, by nine, she would have already been. Um, um, menstruating. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Can I talk a little bit about this? So we actually know that in the modern day, uh, girls reach their menstrual cycle way quicker than they ever did before. And the reason why, from a scientific point of view, is actually nutrition. We have much better tradition now. It's the same reason why they're so tall so early. It's because we have so much great uh, nutrition that we just didn't have before. And if you listen to what uh, experts think about this, when you go back to the Middle Ages and before, you look at when you look at when uh, they. Yeah. You look at when um, people would have, girls would have started their menstrual cycle. It wouldn't have been about till about 14 or 16 between there. So Aisha would have had to have been even more exceptional because the average girl would have started her menstrual cycle way later. It's also worth pointing out that it would have been overwhelmingly more likely she would have started puberty at nine. That's more more acceptable and believable. But menstruating and puberty are different. It wouldn't have been until a few years into puberty that she would have started menstruating. Well, this is, I mean, as I said, he doesn't specifically say that, I think, in the uh, Islamic text. This is just what people have supposed. Uh, I, one, thing I would, one thing I would say is that child marriage was common. Uh, universally, so even in, in Britain, it was common until, from what I've heard, until the 19th century, absolutely. and it was actually within statutes. Yeah, absolutely. But you see, the thing is, and what this is always going to come back to is that I don't have, as my greatest moral example, anyone in the past, not the queens, not the kings, no one. The only one for me is Jesus, and Jesus never did anything like that, but for you it's Muhammad. Yeah. We don't know, for example, what age Mary was when she gave birth to Jesus. She could have been uh, as young as uh, Aisha was when she got married to Muhammad, we don't know. Uh, okay, I'll give you the agnostic view that we don't know. But my point is that nothing says that she was that age, and nothing gives us the view that John was as old as 54, for example. So, my point is that because we know this from the Sahih al Bukhari, from Sahih Muslim, from this hadith that is authentic, we have to wrestle with this question. And it gets even more complicated because for some reason, according to, I think it's Sahih Muslim, Aisha was playing with dolls at a much later age, which is odd. In fact, if you actually try and calculate what age she would have been at the time, because it comes after Muhammad come back from Kaibar, after his victory in Kaibar, she probably would have been about 14, but she was still playing with dolls. You know, a winged horse, the Hadith, of course. And that's difficult, because we don't know how do you reconcile that. Because on the one hand, she was apparently menstruating and having sex with Muhammad at the age of nine. Well, according to Hadith, multiple Hadith, by the way. Well, no, the bit about the menstruation, that's not in the Hadith. Well, be careful, because yeah. Muslims will try and tell you that in um, Syed ibn... Uh, forgive me, I've got the name of the Hadith, but one of the six authentic Hadiths, there's a phrase that supposedly says she was menstruating, okay. but it's not true. If you look at the Arabic, it actually says that she, she breathes, not she menstruated. She breathes? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. But I've, I've heard Muslims in the past... Yeah, but it's related to the fact that she did something because she was out of breath, basically. But um, in this particular, Sayyid Ibn... I can't remember that. He might come to me later. Um, but you're right. Other than that one, which I don't think is legitimate, 
there are no references to her menstruating, which is which is challenging. Yeah. And I don't. You see, if I look at it from a non-Muslim perspective, and I think of a normal person who's 54 years old who chooses to have sex with a nine-year-old, yeah. if you told me that was justified, I couldn't believe you. If you told me that was the greatest moral example to mankind, yeah. I would say, man, you know, you're crazy. In all honesty, I can't, I can't justify that. So, yeah, what I would say is, obviously, with this kind of subject, we're getting into things like child marriage, things like uh, pedophilia, yeah. things like uh, you know, consent, age of consent. Obviously, she was very young. Uh, you know, there's all these issues revolving around this. So what I would say is, when we say that the Prophet Muhammad, he's been one of us, the greatest example, he's an example to us in relation to those things, because what I would say to you is, a lot of those issues are sort of modern day issues, like the concept of pedophilia is a modern day concept, so, the concept of so child marriage, I explained to you that uh, children used to be engaged and often married at a young age. So these, yeah, exactly. Uh, but you notice the marriage was only consummated after she'd uh, started menstruating after she breached the age of. Uh, uh, well, we uh, we don't know that for sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know it's something that Muslims like to think, but it's problematic anyway because menstruation is not a sign of reaching maturity. It's a sign that you're beginning your stages to maturity. For example, uh, scientifically speaking, we know that. Do you accept that uh, a woman can have a child before she started menstruating? It's very unlikely. Yeah, but that's that's what it means. It means that the egg right. is being. Ah, but here's an interesting thing. It's one game too. Yeah. According to scientists now. 80% of monthly sorry, of monthly cycles that women go through as soon as they hit menstruation don't actually ovulate. Uh, no, no. As soon as as soon as a woman menstruates, no matter what age she is, for the first year, 80% of those cycles don't uh, result in ovulation. There's no egg. So it's so you see that this isn't this isn't a clear sign of maturity. In fact, it seems as if you're only beginning the stages. It takes another three years at least for you to start to have uh, the majority of your cycles actually be fertile yeah. and actually be able to to give birth to give rise to a child. Okay, fair enough. But my point was that people in the past were engaged and married at a young age anyway. So. Right. But I don't think nine probably would have been normal. Well, no, we've according to science again, most women wouldn't have even been capable at the age of nine. Well, no, we've so what I've told you was that was it was a universal practice. Even in this country, girls were being married at nine years old in the well, past. Well, I think it's more likely it was more like twelve. We know we know from sources it's more like twelve or thirteen. Yeah, it's not really nine. No, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that didn't happen. Well, it's, I'm it's, sure it it's did. In, I mean, it's in statute law. You can look this up. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah. Don't take my word. I'm talking about what people actually did. Is it what was the norm? And I, I grant you that yes, marriage at a young age, consummation at 12, 13, was something that happened in society. But what, what I'm saying is though, is that that's a, there's a big difference between nine and 12 and 13. There is a huge gap there, like in terms of child development. Yeah. I, I mean, look, now we're, we're sort of just arguing about figures, essentially. Um, I mean, what was the next question you wanted? Okay, sure. So, are you aware that in Islam, if you leave Islam, yeah. there is a death penalty for leaving? Uh, yes. I'm what do you think about that? So, I think um, when it comes to uh, capital punishment, uh, I mean, I support capital punishment generally. Uh, I think that with the death penalty for apostasy, it's related to someone who leaves their religion and then leaves Islam and sort of propagates sort of anti-Islam rhetoric and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I think it's a good safeguard to have a place. Uh, I think if you look at the death penalty, it was used by the church, for example, in relation to heretics during the Inquisition. So it's it's not nothing unique. Again, it's nothing unique to Islam. It's actually can you, was within practice within me, Christianity. Can you tell me a religion that had as part of its scriptural basis this doctrine? Well, I think perhaps Islam might be unique in that respect. Yeah, I think it is. Okay. Well, I don't know if it uses. Yeah. But to me, it seems bizarre, right? So I have friends who are ex-Muslim. Yeah. They don't go to the mosque anymore in the masjid, they, they don't have anything to do with that. Oh, okay. But the thing is, is that... By the way, not going to the mosque doesn't automatically... Well, I, know, I know, I know, I know. But, but the thing is, is that they also probably would say negative things about Islam. If yeah. I ask them what is your view on Islam, they would say, I don't think Islam is the truth. I don't think Muhammad is the prophet, here's the reasons why. Yeah? Okay. Is that, according to you, enough to warrant causing mischief in the land? and enough to warrant the death penalty in Islam to that person. Okay, well I'm not an Islamic scholar or an Islamic judge, so I wouldn't be able to
able to. Uh, uh, okay, so just so that. you know, though, yeah. the four Islamic jurisprudence uh, of law would, would agree that yes, that is worthy of the death penalty. They would argue about how long you have to give, and uh, some would say you have to give a few days, some would say a week, etc., etc. Et but they ultimately agree, yes, that, that it should apply. And so, do you consider, as you put it, as it spread in the France, spreading mischief, spreading corruption in the land? I mean, do you not think that's immoral and that warrants uh, a penalty? But immoral according to who? So, so, for example, um, would you say it's immoral to say bad things about Christianity? Uh, yes, it is. You would? Yeah. Okay. I agree. Well, the Quran itself says bad things about Christianity, from my point of view, right? So, there are things that the three Abrahamic faiths and all faiths in general have in common. I would say that, you know, moral law and moral doctrines are passed Obviously, the bits where Islam and Christianity disagree, there are relatively minor points in relation to the Trinity, in relation to the crucifixion of Jesus. So, I would say apart from those things... I disagree with that. I would say there's actually quite a lot. Okay, such as? Well, we disagree on the authority of Scripture, for one thing. So, for example, in Islam, you think that Scripture comes from eternal tablets, yeah? You think it's been, in some sense, perfectly preserved and that Allah guards his word. Well, it, we don't have the same sense of Scripture being eternal in, in, in Jenna that, that somehow is co-equal with God. We don't have that view. I think, the, I think the Torah was given by God on Mount Sinai. Yeah, but we don't believe it was so. an eternal, uncreated tablet. Okay. In well. the sense that we don't think that there is a another God. Because if you have if you have an, an eternal, uncreated thing, right. then ultimately you associate with something with God. Yeah. Okay. So if you say there's an eternal, uncreated tablet, you're saying there's two gods now. You're saying Allah's a God, and you're saying the well, now, is a God. now you're trying to put words in my mouth. Okay. Well, uh, that, this but. is an argument. Yeah. But I'm aware that this is what Muslims believe. Okay. So I, I want to make you aware that there is, a, according to Islam, there is un uncreated eternal tablets. Yeah. That have Kalamala, Allah's word, on them. And because they are uncreated, I would argue that that means that they are outside of creation, and therefore they are like God. Well, obviously, I wouldn't agree with that. You know, I believe it. I think Allah the one God. Uh, so I mean. I wonder who you were then. I was like, who's this guy? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's eternal in that sense. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's not a sense. god. Do you believe. Um, uh, I was going to say, perfect preservation. We talked about that earlier. Yeah, we, 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 we were talking about that, yeah. Sorry, I was wondering if that was with you or was with someone else. Okay. All right. Okay, well, that's interesting. To me, though, I don't see how Muhammad could be a, a perfect example. Okay, why not? I mean, you, we've raised... Okay, so, raised so some first of all, Muhammad himself had people killed, yeah? So I think a prophet having people killed, particularly in the context of them uh, criticizing him, so he had people who wrote poems about him, there was, there's even a, a hadith that talks about a, a woman who said bad things about him. She was a she did poetry. He ordered her to be killed. I don't think that's good. I don't think that's what the greatest moral example does. Well, there were there were Old Testament prophets who had people killed. Moses had people. Killed. Absolutely, but we again, I don't think those Old Testament prophets are the greatest moral example. Okay. I think Jesus is, and Jesus didn't have people killed. Yeah. Well, we, we've reached. It's a, that's an interesting point you raise. So in Islam, we believe in all the prophets from Adam through to Jesus and Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Now, as a Muslim, I would say, you know, one prophet is, uh, you know, worse than another prophet because of X, Y, Z. Obviously, we say Muhammad was the last and final and greatest uh, prophet, but we, we look back at all the prophets and, and we, we, you know, we don't sort of nitpick, well, you, did he you kill not, people? Do you not see how Jesus, or in your version, Isa, yeah. is such a clear moral superior to, to Muhammad. I, I don't see how you could even, that even could even be argued. Because okay. I mean, like according to the Quran, Esau was sinless, yeah? I mean, I know you believe all the prophets were sinless, yes. but Esau was sinless. We believe that as well. Yes. Esau, what, he created clay birds and he, and he breathed life into them. Yeah. He, he defended Miriam from an early age from the crib. He did all these miracles, but Muhammad is not recorded as doing any miracles in the Quran. Yeah. I know that he, apparently he split the moon, but I mean, there are problems with that, I think. But, and we believe the Quran is a miracle, by the way, so... <laughs> well, but why is the Quran a miracle? There are so many problems. Remember we talked earlier about the preservation of the Quran. I don't think 
think the preservation of the Quran is, is is clear. I think it's very much obvious it wasn't perfectly preserved. The preservation is a miracle because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said he will preserve it, that is a miracle when your book right. comes up. But it wasn't preserved though, right? There were different versions of the Quran. Abdullah ibn Masud had his own Quranic codex. No. Yes, no, our, our, our criteria is first of all is coming from memorizing. This is the first criteria. Right, listen, right, right. listen, listen, listen. And this turn back to, to, to the miracle. Okay? Do not, not oh, so me. Me. Wait, you just came in and you just talked about the, the perfect preservation. So what I'm saying is, is that Muhammad said there are four people you can learn the Quran from. One of them was Abdullah ibn Masood. Did he talk to you about miracles, yes or no? I haven't yeah. talked to well, we, we, we were going on to it, but you, you just came in and I'm now addressing you because you just came in. Yeah. What I'm saying is, is that the Quran has not been perfectly preserved because the uh, two other companions that Muhammad said that you should uh, learn the Quran from said there were different Qurans with different surahs. You know, even, even the, the, the differences, what you call them differences, who they are not, who they are not. If they come in from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if they come in from the same source, mm. yeah, yeah, that means is that when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said to you, the Quran is come down in seven letters, okay? Where is the problem there? The problem is that there are parts of it that are now lost. Sorry? Ubay ibn Kab had 116 surahs. The current Quran only has 114. You've lost some of it. No, that's a, that's is a lie. That's a lie. Yes, so, so your traditions don't say Uba, Ubay ibn Kab was. That's what the Shia say. That's what, that's what Shia say. What Ubay Shia ibn Kab was trusted by Muhammad as one of the four reciters of the Quran that people should learn the Quran from. What he said he, he's a reciter. Yeah. He's not a writer. Yeah. He had his own codex. He had it written down. There was, there was a. Can write, that was no, each one he can write what, what piece he wants to write. Uthman had it destroyed. What, what, hmm? what verses? Everyone he can write what verses he wants to write. Right, but he was, he was considered no. an authoritative figure no. according to Muhammad. No. Yeah, they are too many. They were too many. According, yes. Right. So, so even though that he he was one of the best reciters of the Quran, now, his version topic? didn't come into the Quran. The well, no, that's what you topic? talked about. You talked about. You no. asked me about it, okay. so I'm asking you. Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I talked to you about it before. I know that, but okay. he's now asking me. Okay. You want to talk about? Or you want to talk about preservation about the Quran? We can talk about preservation of the Quran if you want to talk and about Bible. that. Yeah, all right, all right, let's do a comparison, let's do a comparison. Let's yes. compare how the Quran was preserved and how the Bible was preserved. Yes, that's right, that's let's compare them. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Go on then, here we go. I'll let you go. First, give me... Take care, mate. First, give me a link. First, give me a link. A link? Between, yes, okay. link between. Oh, right, not, not a web link. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Give me a link between the Old Testament you have today mm. and Moses and give me the link between the New Testament we have today and Jesus. Go ahead. Right, I'll start with the, the New Testament and Jesus because that's the one that's I think most easily is proven. And the reason why is because the New Testament was written a lot later than the Old Testament. By the time that the New Testament came about, we had multiple people at, uh, who gave independent attestation to the Gospels. So we have the, we have the synaptic, uh, synoptic Gospels, which is one source. And we have the, the John-based uh, gospel, which is another source. Yeah. Both of these collaborate with each other and yeah. they confirm each other. Yeah. We know yeah. that John is the beloved disciple of Jesus. Yeah. And we know that he was a first-hand witness to what Jesus preached. Yeah. We know that, for example, the gospel of Mark. Mark got his information from Peter. Peter was a disciple and apostle of Jesus. Yeah. Give, me, give me where Mark approved for the Mark he said, I get it from Peter. And Mark, he wasn't eyewitness to Jesus. We have Peter. earliest traditions that say that Mark got it from Peter. Yeah, we also know... Give me a proof of that, give me a proof of that. Give me a manuscript where Mark, he stated, I get it from Peter. From early church fathers. Give me a proof when Mark... I'm not it would be the manuscripts of the early church fathers yes, me, that talk about no, that no, as a... No. I'm asking you, give me a proof when Mark, he said, I get it from Peter. It is a tradition that is preserved from the early church fathers, which is why you don't find it. I'm not asking you about tradition, I'm asking you approve where Mark he said, I get it from Peter. I already told you, you, you won't find it in Mark proof. as a thing, but you, you will find it in the proof. early church fathers. You don't have a single proof, you don't have a single link between Jesus and the gospel who you have today. And you don't have a single proof, you don't have, listen, you don't have a, list, a single proof that the, the Old Testament you have today is come from Moses. If you have, then show me proof to me, please. Okay, do you know how manuscripts are preserved? Do you know how that process works? 
I'm asking a question. Okay, all right, let me let me give you let me give you a little rough down on give this. Give me a link. So we have we have papyrus here, which is dried leaves that are interlaced with each other. Papyrus degrades over a few years. So in other words, when you copy something down, like scripture, you have effectively a time limit until that papyrus breaks down. So that explains why we wouldn't expect to have manuscripts prior to the New Testament. And even the New Testament, the only ones that we have come from the second century. I'm explaining why in the Old Testament, we would not be able to have manuscripts from that period. You have non single manuscript that from first century, we, none. We, 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 have, um, we have manuscripts from the early second century that in order for them to have existed, they're literally How the size long? of tablets, exactly. they would have... They, they, sir, wait, wait, wait like let, card, yep, no? let, let, me, let me finish this. What is the rest? Let, let me explain. I, I already... Plus, wait, let me plus, finish. You asked me a question. You asked me a question. Years after Jesus, there is no That's not 150 years after Jesus. Yes, no, 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 no. Let, no first of all, when did Jesus die? Okay, when, did Jesus, when did Jesus die? When did Jesus die? When Jesus died? 33 AD. Yes, yes most people say 33 yes. AD. So we have manuscripts from the early second century that are the size of a credit card, yeah? But when, the, when, what when, you when, don't understand second, is... Second, when, when? <sighs> Can I explain this to you? When, 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 when? No, no, I didn't hear the, the date. So early second century. So you're talking In like 110, 120 AD. Yeah. 100. Is yeah. That, now, when we have those manuscripts, what? Let me, explain, let me explain. Let me explain to you. The link let me explain it to you. And Jesus. I ex and have, listen, uh, listen, my friend. You have to piece. let me answer. You have to actually let me answer. A small piece, like. No, the, yes, the a small piece. Yes. Card. But where does it come from? This is a copy. Yes, that's not the original. So if it was a copy, yes. that means that the original manuscripts would have come decades before that. So Where that's why it? we put them to the, the first century. The now, that is for the later yeah. one. Yeah. I have to put my camera to Lamin. Let's talk about where the earliest church records we have. The earliest church records that's we have come from Paul, yes? Paul was writing 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. These are the earliest letters we have that are dated in about 20 years. I'm asking about the gospel. I'm asking about the gospel. But Paul wrote about things that are included in the gospel. We actually can find quotes from Jesus that are recorded by Paul in his letters. That is not true. Why are you going away? I'm a cameraman. You know me, I'm a cameraman here. I have to put my camera. You ask me a question. Okay, wrap wow. Up. Uh, wrap up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, wrap sure, sure. The first but there is no link. There is a link. I was telling Come you and explaining you to not, it, and you went off. That is not. Oh. That is not. I have to put my camera. I have to put my camera. Alright, sure, put my yeah. Camera. Okay, so just first of all, just that conversation that we had. It started with a nice chat with a Muslim who uh, has recently become a Muslim, unfortunately. And we were talking about how the Quran hasn't been perfectly preserved how Ubay ibn Kab, how Abdullah ibn Masud were two of the companions that were trusted to recite the Quran and how they had totally different versions of what we have today. That's clear evidence that the Quran hasn't been perfectly preserved. This chat that I just had with this, uh, this Muslim gentleman, he effectively ran away. I started to explain how papyrus, how it grades over time. That's the reason why you can't expect there to be manuscript evidence of direct copies of the gospel because unfortunately papyrus grades. I was going to talk about the early church, but he's run off, and, and that was sort of it. So, talking a little bit about presentism, an interesting point. Muslims will tell you, ad infinitum, that they believe in objective morality. That they believe that there is one God, Allah, and He is the source of all objective morality and objective truth. But when you talk about inconvenient moral truths, like for example, the very edgy case of Muhammad having sex with a nine-year-old, they will switch the argument and they'll start talking about how, well, in their culture that was acceptable, therefore it's okay. But remember, that's a subjective argument. They switch. They switch from an objective argument to a subjective one. They can't have both. Only one has to be true.